Peace be with you. Friends, I don't know if you had the chance to read the Pope's new book. It's called Jesus of Nazareth. If you haven't, don't walk but run to the bookstore and get it, or call Amazon and order it. It's a wonderful book. It's deeply insightful, and it's relatively easy to read. Even though it's written by one of the great academic theologians of the 20th century, it's rather unencumbered by lots of academic jargon. Well, to me, the most interesting section of this book comes about a third of the way through, when Josef Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, engages the work of an American rabbi named Jacob Neusner. Neusner is a rabbi and theologian who's written an extraordinary number of books and articles on biblical theology. He grew up around Christians, lectures with many Christian scholars at the university where he teaches. He has a deep respect for and interest in Christian theology. In fact, he so respects Christianity that he's willing to engage its claims and take them seriously, even when they disagree with his own convictions. Too much ecumenical dialogue, especially in the years after Vatican II, has been flat and uninteresting. How come? Precisely because no one wants to offend. You know, the great goal of much ecumenical conversation in the last 30 years has been to get along, and there's nothing in the world wrong with getting along. However, the trouble is, a lot of our really consequential differences are ironed over. Josef Ratzinger likes the fact that Jacob Neusner engages in much harder-headed ecumenical conversation. He wrote a book called A Rabbi Speaks to Jesus, and the Pope liked this book a lot. What Neusner does in this text is he enters imaginatively into a dialogue with Jesus. He imagines himself as a Jewish listener of the first century, sitting in the crowd as the young charismatic rabbi from Nazareth speaks. What's his reaction as he hears the words of Jesus? How would a first century Jew take it all in? Well, he signals his deep admiration for Jesus. Many of the things that Jesus says are wonderful, are deeply in tune with the prophets and the patriarchs. He is in many ways, Neusner says, a great Jewish teacher. And any attentive, intelligent first century Jew would have seen that. However, he says, Jesus adds something new, something you don't find in the patriarchs and the prophets. And this, Neusner says, is the problem. Jesus adds himself. What do I mean? Well, listen to some of his words. Unless you love me more than your mother and father, more than your very life, you're not worthy of me. Now listen, no prophet, no patriarch, not even Moses, would ever arrogate to himself that kind of authority. You might imagine one of the prophets saying, unless you love Yahweh more than your very life, you're not worthy of Him. Okay. But can you imagine Isaiah or Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Abraham, Jacob, saying, unless you love me more than your very life, you're not worthy of me? This Neusner says bothers him. Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say, well, that's in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said where? In the Torah. Well, the Torah is the Word of God. That's God's own law. Moses receives the Torah, and then every figure after him, including the great prophets, point back to it. Yes, they call people to allegiance to the Torah. Listen to it. Return to it in faith. But nobody ever says in the Jewish tradition, well, you've heard it said in the Torah, but I say. That's to claim an authority greater than that of the Torah. Neusner says, as a Jew, I just can't tolerate that. I just can't accept that. 
How about this one? It's a bit more subtle, but interesting. Jesus says, In me find your rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, we say, okay, that seems rather uncontroversial. Ah, but listen to it now with Jewish ears, Neusner says. In me find your rest. Well, where was a pious Jew supposed to find his rest? In the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the great day of rest. The day of Yahweh, the day that belongs to God. That's where you find your rest. But now we have Jesus, this rabbi, this human being, saying, I am the one in whom you find your rest. He now identifies himself with the day of Yahweh, with the Sabbath. Hmm, Neusner says. This Jesus is an attractive figure, yes, Inspiring, yes, of course. Like Jeremiah and Isaiah, yes, in many ways. But, he identifies himself with God. And this, a good Jew, cannot accept. More to it, Neusner says. From an Old Testament perspective, the Messiah was supposed to bring something. Namely, universal peace and well-being. He was to usher in an age of righteousness. Well, says this American rabbi, along with many of his co-religionists, say what you want about Jesus. Say he's a great teacher. Say he's a great inspiring figure. He didn't bring these things. You know what I'm saying? Just the most casual survey of the news would show he didn't bring these things. There isn't universal peace. The age of righteousness clearly hasn't come. Therefore, Neusner says, he can't be the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. Okay. That's strong stuff. That's a strong argument. This is not namby-pamby uh, ecumenical dialogue. This has taken on the central issue. And Josef Ratzinger likes it. He likes the frankness and bluntness of this appraisal. And he feels that entering into dialogue with Neusner helps to clarify enormously some major points of Catholic theology. First, Neusner is right about the claims of Jesus, says the Pope. Even though it runs counter to much liberal academic theology from 200 years ago to the present day, Jesus did indeed claim a unique divine authority. Though it goes against the grain of a lot of our spiritual writing today, Jesus did not present himself merely as one more in a long line of prophets. No, no, he did present himself as the one who in his own person had the authority of Yahweh himself. Offensive? Well, maybe, but that, says the Pope, was indeed the claim of Jesus. And therefore, now everything will hinge on this, therefore, Jesus presented himself as the culminating figure in the long story of Israel. And it's around this affirmation that the Pope crafts his answer to Neusner. Listen. God created not out of any need of His own, but simply out of a desire to share His beauty in His life. He wanted human beings to find themselves precisely by accepting His love and by sharing it with the rest of creation. This desire of God, expressed clearly in the book of Genesis, was interrupted by sin. Look sometime at the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis stretching from the story of creation, Adam and Eve, the fall, all the way through Cain and Abel, Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel, what you see is a brilliant symbolic depiction of what sin looks like, of what went wrong with God's plan. Hatred, separation, scapegoating, violence, murder, domination, suffering. God's desire for us interrupted by sin. So what did God do? Now turn to chapter 12 of the book of Genesis. He chose Abram, later called Abraham, 
to go from Ur of the Chaldees to a promised land. He called Abraham to obedience and through him he began the formation of a great people. A people according to his own heart. A people formed according to his law, formed according to his desire. This long history commencing with Abraham stretching through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the long slavery in Egypt, the liberation associated with Moses, the giving of the law, the entry into the promised land, the emergence of the prophets, the exile to Babylon, the return, the establishment of the temple. This whole great story is the story of Yahweh forming a people according to His heart. And what was the purpose of this people? To bring salvation to the world. Not to revel in the fact that they were specially chosen, no, but to see their vocation as the means by which God would bring salvation to the whole world. A light to the nations. Now, listen to this line from our first reading. They shall bring all your brothers and sisters from all the nations as an offering to the Lord. To Jerusalem, my holy mountain, says the Lord. That's Isaiah's dream that through this people Israel, God would draw the nations of the world into right worship. He'd bring them to Jerusalem. Okay. Who is Jesus? Jesus is presented in the Gospels as the fulfillment of this promise. As the climax to this ancient story. On the one hand, He is fully human. Yes, the Jewish rabbi from Nazareth, a successor of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. Yes, a great prophet of Israel. Neusner sees this rightly and appreciates it. But then comes that stumbling point. He was also, the Gospels claim, God. As we say in the Creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. That means He's also Yahweh in person. That means He's also the God, listen now, not simply of Israel, but of all the nations. Precisely as divine, Jesus is the one now who can open the way to bring the God of Israel to all the nations. Precisely by assuming the divine authority, he brings Israelite history to its fulfillment and becomes the means by which the tradition of Israel becomes a saving message to the world. In that way, the Pope says, he did indeed bring the Messianic era. He has brought peace to the nations because he's brought the God of Israel to the nations. Take a look at the Pope's book, especially this argument with Rabbi Neusner and see the power it has for understanding who we are as a Christian church. And God bless you. Peace be with you. Friends, I want to concentrate this week on our second reading, which is a very brief but very punchy passage from Paul's magnificent letter to the Romans. It comes at the very end of chapter 11, which completes a major section of the letter, in which the Apostle considers Israel in relation to the church. Keep in mind, Paul was a Jew, thoroughly trained in the ways and beliefs of his people, utterly devoted to Israel's identity and mission. But then he received the revelation of Christ, and he knew he had to think things through again. How to make sense of the ancient Jewish tradition in light of the dying and rising of Jesus? And to make the thing really pointed, here's what he's wrestling with. How to understand Gentiles, so Greeks and Romans, coming to the faith when salvation was supposed to come through the Jews, many of whom, in fact, were rejecting the Christian faith. So for a Jew who's now become a follower of Jesus, this is a point of some confusion. And so Paul spends three entire chapters of Romans wrestling with this. So if you want the details of that conversation, pick up your Bibles and look at Romans 9, 10, and 11. 
But it, my focus today in the sermon is not so much that issue. It's this very interesting little passage that comes at the end of his consideration. At the end of this dense and intellectually impressive consideration of the issue, Paul throws up his hands, or better, exults in the mystery of God that he knows now he cannot fully grasp. See, his theologian's mind is working on this dilemma of of Israel and the church, but at the end of it, he realizes, "I, I don't fully get it. And so he says, and here's the famous passage, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments. How unsearchable his ways. Beautiful, isn't it, from a poetic standpoint? But also of great theological and spiritual importance. How depth, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments. How unsearchable his ways. You know, some things in the theological order make sense. As we're thinking through the things of God and how God relates to the world, you know, we can make sense of some of it. But let's face it, lots of other things in theology uh, don't make sense readily. And I'll tell you, I specialize in this because I was trained as a philosopher and then as a theologian. I taught theology for 20 years at the seminary. So I know a lot about this feeling that St. Paul has of kind of throwing up your hands at the end of a long process of thought to say, I just don't really understand how deep, how strange, how inscrutable are the ways of God. Let me give you a couple of famous examples of this. How do we reconcile, for example, God's foreknowledge and human freedom? Right? If God knows everything and his knowledge can't fail, well, isn't the future fixed? I mean, if God knows for sure what I'm going to do uh, next year, am I really free not to do it? It's, it's going to happen. I know that. Doesn't that mean everything is determined? That if everything is determined, how can we be free? And if we're not free, how can we be morally responsible? See, I'm driving it. It's a serious problem, a dilemma. Or how do we make sense of God's universal desire that all people be saved? with the fact of damnation. If God's love is infinite, his will is finally irresistible, then why are some lost? And just to make it more pointed, how could a God of infinite love ever countenance something as horrific as eternal suffering? Or bring this problem home to everybody. How could God allow the innocent to suffer so much? How do we square God's love and power with a child having leukemia, with the deaths of hundreds of thousands in a tsunami, with torture and human trafficking, etc., etc.? To state the problem abstractly, if God is all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful, it seems there wouldn't be any evil at all right? He'd know about it, he'd want to do something about it, and he could do something about it. Therefore, if there's evil, it seems that that kind of God, anyway, doesn't exist. Now, I throw these out to you just to make this point, that, I mean, after many years of thinking these things through, and that's what a theologian does for a living, is you think through these, these hard issues, after thinking them through and, you know, to be fair, making some progress. I mean, I can, I can attempt to, to explain all these things to a degree. But I'll confess to you, I tend to end up where Paul did. How inscrutable are his judgments. How unsearchable his ways. In other words, I don't completely know. And I end up surrendering my mind to God. Now, mind you, this is not fundamentalism or or fideism. This is not to give up on the attempt to understand. No, no. 
This is the prayerful surrender that comes at the end of a long struggle to know. Does that make sense? See, you can surrender at the beginning. I'm not even going to bother. I'm not even going to enter into the lists. That's fideism. That's that's a, a mere superstition. But there's this move, which is after having thought something through very deeply, now prayerfully surrendering to the mystery. Let me try to make sense of this with, um, with a couple of examples. Suppose you've come to know another person pretty well in the course of many years. Perhaps you, you first investigated the person on your own before you even formally met. Maybe you Googled his name, you checked out his accomplishments, you listened to what other people said about him. Maybe you made your own observations uh, from a distance. Then finally, you met him and you became his friend. And now, over many months, eventually many years, you've watched him at close quarters, you've listened to him, you've seen his reactions to a variety of situations, you've endured tragedy with him, et cetera, et cetera. Having gone through all of that, you probably could say with a good deal of confidence that you know him. If someone asked you how your friend might react in a given situation, you could probably predict it with some ease, right? And yet, and yet, he will still surprise you. And yet, he will say and do things that remain inscrutable to you. Right? Think of, of your, your best friend. Think of someone you've known for your whole life. I bet there's still aspects of his or her personality that, that are just surprising to you, inscrutable to you. I've known married couples, married for 50 years, who say, she's now more mysterious to me than she was when I first met her. I totally get that. Now, turn up the heat. Another example. Imagine a child, say of of three or four years, trying to understand the actions and motivations of his parents. So the kid, the four-year-old, you know, knows in a deep, instinctual way that his parents love him and want what's best for him. But yet, what, huge swaths of his parents' behavior must seem utterly incomprehensible to him. Why they refuse him things that he wants? Why won't they let him play where he wants to? Why do they drag him to a doctor who sticks needles into him? Why do they send him to school when he'd so much rather stay at home, etc.? Put yourself in the mind of a four-year-old trying to understand the motivations of his parents. I mean, there'd be a universe of things that the child finds incomprehensible. And if that kid were miraculously infused with the vocabulary of St. Paul, he'd probably cry out, how inscrutable are their judgments? How unsearchable their ways, right? Now, the point, which I'm sure you've gotten by now, When dealing with God, first of all, we are dealing with a person. And persons are always mysterious, no matter how well we know them. And dealing, that's that's a human person, right, is mysterious and inscrutable. Now, you're dealing with an infinite divine person whose mind is concerned with all of space and all of time. God's power, purpose are infinite. Our minds, infinitesimally tiny by comparison. Of course God's ways and judgments are going to be inscrutable to us. Now, think of that second example. Think of the chasm that yawns between a child's puny consciousness and the purposes of his parents. And that, that's why the child finds his parents so, so frustrating and, and so mysterious, is that there's this chasm 
yawns between what he can grasp and what they're up to, right? Now, now, multiply to an infinite degree that chasm, and you find something like the chasm between our little minds and the mind and purposes of God. Puzzling that there are all kinds of things we don't understand about God? Not at all, it seems to me. It's not puzzling at all. We shake our fists sometimes at heaven. Why, oh, why would that be possible? Why would God do such a thing? Think of the child vis-a-vis his parents. Now multiply it, heighten it to the millionth degree, the infinite degree, and you've got something of what obtains between us and God. And therefore, we do properly say that God is inscrutable, that he's mysterious, always surprising and elusive. But do we therefore despair? Do we therefore give up or at the limit say, I think all this is nonsense? No, 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 no. We surrender in faith. The surrender that comes at the end of a long process of seeking to know. But we surrender in faith in the manner of a child, surrendering to what he trusts to be his parents' loving plan. I know it's a hard place to get to, everybody. I understand that. There's the one extreme of, oh, just you know, accept everything and just, just be sort of naive and superstitious. The other extreme of a kind of hypercritical rationalism. No, no, the church is drawing us now, following Paul into this vibrant space. Yes, think deeply about the things of God. But at the end of the day, we surrender prayerfully. Lord, how inscrutable your judgments, how unsearchable your ways. And God bless you. Peace be with you, and a very blessed and happy Easter to everybody. Friends, what's Easter all about? Let me start with this. In first century Judaism, so in the time of the New Testament, there were many views concerning what happened to people after they died. So following a very venerable tradition, some said that death was just the end, that the dead simply returned to the dust of the earth from which they came. Again, it's got very ancient roots within Judaism, that view. Others around Jesus' time maintained that the righteous dead would rise at the close of the age. Think of, you know, when Jesus uh, approaches the tomb of Lazarus and Martha says, yes, I, I believe that he will rise at the resurrection of the dead. That's what she meant, at the end of the age. Still others thought, maybe a bit here under the influence of Greek philosophy, that the souls of the just went to live with God after the demise of their bodies. Think of the book of Daniel here. In the book of Wisdom, you have some reference to this. Some, it seemed, even believe in a kind of reincarnation. Think of when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And some of them say, well, you know, Jeremiah or one of the prophets come back from the dead. So there are all kinds of views about what happened after we die. Here's what's particularly fascinating about the accounts of Jesus' resurrection is that none of these familiar frameworks of understanding is invoked. They had all kinds of ways to articulate it. None of them is used. The first witnesses maintained that the same Jesus who had been brutally and unmistakably put to death and buried, Mind you, Roman executioners didn't uh, botch the job. I mean, they, they knew how to put people to death. That Jesus, who had died and had been buried, was, through the power of God, alive again. The point is, they didn't say he was vaguely with God in some sense, or that his soul had escaped from his body. They are not Greeks. Nor had he risen in some purely symbolic or metaphorical sense, nor were they looking forward to all this great day at the end of time when he would rise. No, no. Here's what they claim. He, Yeshua from Nazareth, this friend whom they knew, 
who had been put to death brutally and buried, was alive again. If I can put it to some degree in the perspective of the other expectations, what was expected for all the righteous dead at the end of time had happened in time to this one particular man, to this Jesus. See, as I've said this, I know a lot to you, but it was the very novelty of the event that gave such energy and verve to the first Christian proclamation. You know, if they were just trading in these old frameworks, what would be particularly interesting or, or, uh, or energetic about it? But on practically every page of the New Testament, we find this grab you by the lapels quality. Because these early witnesses to the resurrection were not trading in bland spiritual abstractions or moral bromides. They were trying to tell the whole world that something so new and astounding had happened that nothing would ever be the same again. That's resurrection proclamation. That's Christianity. Over the past, really, couple of centuries, Many thinkers, both inside and outside of the Christian churches, have endeavored to reduce the resurrection message to the level of a myth or a symbol. Easter, they argued, was one more iteration of the springtime saga that can be found in one form or another in most cultures, namely that life, you know, triumphs over death in the, quote, resurrection of nature after the bleak months of winter. You know, go back to ancient mythology, come up through the stories of the different cultures, you find this resurrection myth, the springtime saga. Others maintained the resurrection is just a symbolic way of saying that the cause of Jesus lives on in his followers. Well, you know, it was C.S. Lewis, a long time ago, put paid to these interpretations when he observed that those who think the resurrection story is a myth simply haven't read many myths. Mythic literature deals in ahistorical archetypes and thus it tends to speak of things that happened once upon a time or to bring it up to date in a galaxy far, far away. Myths are trading in these great abstractions and they're beautiful, important. I love the myths. But the point is the Gospels don't use that kind of language. In describing the resurrection, they mention particular places like Judea and Jerusalem. They specify the event took place not once upon a time or in a galaxy far, far away. It took place when Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor. We can date that. There are coins with Pontius Pilatus on them. We know exactly when that was. More to it, they named distinct individuals, Peter, John, James, Thomas, etc., who encountered Jesus after he rose from the dead. People that knew him, that had touched him and seen him and talked to him. Finally, everybody, listen, nobody dies defending mythic claims. Again, I love the myths. I'm not bad-mouthing myths for a second. They're terrific. I love them. I read them. They're ex extremely interesting. They're very important in the development of culture, all of that. But nobody died for Zeus or Dionysus or Osiris. There are no martyrs of Thor. But practically all the first heralds of the resurrection of Jesus went to their deaths defending the truth of their historical claim. I, I want that to sink in this Easter, the difference, the difference of these gospel stories and of the people who told them and defended them. Okay. But what does the resurrection mean? What are some implications we can draw from the resurrection? I think it means first, that the customary manner in which we understand the relationship between order and violence, and I mean from the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Game of Thrones, has to be rethought. Let me say that again. The manner in which we understand the relationship between order and violence has to be rethought.
here's what I mean. On the standard sort of realistic, realpolitik reading of things, order comes about through the violent imposition of the will of the stronger. And again, from ancient mythology all the way to Game of Thrones, that's what you see is relatively powerful people imposing their will through violence. Now, it can be very straightforward, like the violence of a bully on a playground. It can be a much more refined exercise of violence through geopolitical strategy. But the myth remains the same. Order comes through violence. Now, mind you, in Jesus' time, the great principle of order was the Empire of Rome, which maintained its hold how? Through the exertions of its massive army and and through the imposition of harsh punishment on those who had opposed its purposes. The most terrible and fearsome of those punishments was the cross, a particularly brutal mode of torture. They think the Romans might have gotten it from Persians or from somewhere in the Middle East. But it was purposely carried out in public so as to have the greatest deterrent effect. It was precisely on one of those Roman crosses that Yeshua from Nazareth was put to death. Having been betrayed and abandoned by his friends and condemned by a corrupt tribunal of collaborators with the Roman authorities. Now, when the risen Jesus presented himself alive to his disciples, they, we, they were, we are told, afraid. Now, you could say their fear might have been simply a function of their having seen something uncanny, a dead man come back to life. But I wonder sometimes whether it might have been grounded in the assumption that he was back for vengeance. In any telling of of a similar tale, if someone made up a story like this, here's an innocent man, a good man, who'd been put to death because of the betrayal and abandonment, denial of his followers who had run from him at the moment of truth. And if now in the imagination of the storyteller, this dead man was back to life and he's come to visit those who had betrayed him and denied him, what would you expect? You'd expect he's back for vengeance. See, again, order comes through violence. That's the way we tend to tell the story. But this story is different. After showing his wounds, the risen Jesus says to his friends, Shalom, peace. The teacher who had urged his followers to turn the other cheek and to meet violence with forgiveness exemplified his own teaching in the most vivid way possible. And what he showed thereby was that the divine manner of reestablishing order has nothing to do with violence, retribution, or eye-for-an-eye retaliation. Instead, it has to do with a love which swallows up hate, with a forgiveness which triumphs over aggression. It's this great resurrection principle which explicitly or implicitly undergirded the liberating work of Martin Luther King in America, of Gandhi in India, of Bishop Tutu in South Africa, of John Paul II in Poland. Those great practitioners of nonviolent resistance were able to stand athwart the received wisdom only because they had some sense that in opting for the way of love, they were going with the deepest grain of reality. They were operating in concert with the purpose of God. Here's a second implication, everybody, from the resurrection. It means that God has not given up on his creation. According to the well-known account in the book of Genesis, God made the whole array of finite things. Sun, moon, planets, stars, animals, plants, things that creep and crawl on the earth. And he found it all good, even very good. There's not a hint of dualism or Manichaeism in the biblical vision. There's no setting of the spiritual over and against the material. All that God has made reflects some aspect of his goodness, and all created things together constitute a beautiful and tightly woven tapestry. As the Old Testament lays out the story, human sin made a wreck of God's creation, 
But the faithful God kept sending rescue operation after rescue operation. From Noah's Ark through the prophets, the law, the temple, the people, Israel itself. And finally he sent his only son, the perfect icon or incarnation of his love. Now here's the point, everybody. In raising that son from the dead, God definitively saved and ratified his creation, very much including the material dimension of it. That's why the bodily resurrection of Jesus matters so much. Over and again, we've said no to what God has made, but God stubbornly says yes. And it's inspired by this divine yes that we always have reason to hope. That's what Easter means. And God bless you. Peace be with you. Friends, today is the great feast of the Trinity, Trinity Sunday. I've often said it's the preacher's nightmare. Preachers hate trying to come up with new ideas about the Trinity, which is such a great mystery. But I tell the students here at the seminary, every Sunday is Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday is a wonderful time to preach because it gives us a chance to talk about God. Who is God? The doctrine of the Trinity gives us this peculiarly Christian understanding of God. You know, I've quoted to you, I think, before Stanley Hauerwas, the Methodist theologian. When someone says, God bless you to him, his response is, which one? There are a lot of views of God floating around, a lot of different ideas, different philosophies of God. And we Christians have a very distinctive one. It's summed up in this claim from the first letter of John, that God is love. God is is love. We become so accustomed to that little phrase that we take it for granted. But that phrase is very strange and very unique. Breathtaking when you think about it. And it sums up the distinctiveness of the Christian view of God. You know, when Pope Benedict XVI issued his first encyclical under that title, Deus Caritas Est, God is Love, many of the commentators said, well, isn't that nice? You know, isn't that sweet? Kind of a nice sentimental idea. We thought Benedict was going to be a toughie and his first letter is about God is love. And they sort of sentimentalized the idea. Well, that's to look at it very superficially. Let me get at what this phrase means by way of contrast. I think there are two views of God that have been around for a long time. They're still around today. They're very popular that are opposed to the view that God is love. Pantheism and deism. Pantheism and deism. The first one, pantheism, the view somehow that everything is God, God is everything, is very ancient. You can find it in people like Heraclitus, Parmenides, the Stoics, those Gnostics whom I mentioned a few weeks ago, you can find it there. Oh, but it pops up, too, very much in the modern period. The founder of modern liberal Protestantism, a theologian named Friedrich Schleiermacher, was a pantheist. So was Baruch Spinoza, the great Jewish philosopher. Spinoza famously said, Deus sive natura. That means God or nature. They mean the same thing. Schleiermacher said that a religious person has a sense and taste for the infinite. That means he has a sense of the whole, the all, as being identical to God. You know where you can see it very much in the popular culture today? Star Wars movies. The Star Wars movies were very influenced by Joseph Campbell, who was a comparative mythologist. Campbell was interviewed by Bill Moyers now about 20 years ago in a famous series of interviews on PBS. Moyers asked him, do you believe in a personal God? Campbell said, no. When he was asked to elaborate, Campbell said, I think God is the zoom of energy that runs through all things. Huh. That's ancient pantheism again on display. The zoom of energy that runs through all things. Now I mentioned Star Wars. George Lucas, who made the Star Wars movies, said, they were explicitly based upon Campbell's ideas. And what do we find in Star Wars but the force? What's the force? It's the zoom of energy that runs through all things. 
It can be exploited negatively by Darth Vader. It can be exploited positively by Luke Skywalker. But the idea is it's just this energy field that runs through all reality. Now, this view of God, ancient and modern, very popular, much of New Age mysticism, by the way, is influenced by it. But this view of God is irreconcilable with the view that God is love. Why? Well, because this God is fundamentally impersonal. And if I can put it this way, is too close to us to be a God of love. To love is to will the good of the other as other. This pantheist God is impersonal and is too close to the world, really, to love the world. Here's the second view of God that I think is irreconcilable with the view that God is love. It's deism. Now, the roots of this, too, are very ancient and very tangled. Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, said that God is the prime mover. He's the supreme being at the top of the hierarchy of being. But Aristotle's supreme being, his first mover, is basically indifferent to the world. The world's attracted to him, but he's uninterested in the world. Plato talks about the form of the good, which, like the sun, shines on all things, but is basically impersonal and indifferent to the world. Plato's disciple Plotinus talked about the one, and the one is beyond being, beyond this world. We aspire after the one, but the one is indifferent to us. Where else can you find this idea? Well, in a somewhat different form, in Reformation Protestantism. The Reformers, Luther and Calvin, put a huge stress on the sovereignty of God on the otherness of God, the transcendence of God. Calvin called it the godliness of God. When the modern philosophers came along, influenced by the Protestant theologians, they gave us this peculiarly modern form of deism. God is now construed as the supreme being, way beyond the world, both chronologically and spatially, if I can put it that way. At the beginning of time, God established the laws of the universe, but then let the universe go. While he remains fundamentally indifferent to it. Well, in the modern period, everybody from Isaac Newton to John Locke to Leibniz to Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were deists. The supreme being, having established the laws of the cosmos, pretty much leaves us alone. Now, this view of God, too, I think, is very much in the popular consciousness today. In fact, I would guess if you pressed most Americans, you'd find some version of deism. What's the sign of it? Secularism. Secularism is a modern construct. That there is a realm of reality, a realm of being, that is basically untouched by God. The realm of economics and politics and culture, the secular world, untouched by the distant God. Now, the first view of God, pantheism, that's irreconcilable with the view that God is love. And so is this deism. Because the deistic God is supreme and transcendent and impressive, but the deistic God does not will the good of the world, remains fundamentally indifferent to the world, allows a space of pure secularity to open up. If the Star Wars God is too close to be a God of love, the deist God is too far. Okay, now we're getting closer to a biblical view. You can see the biblical view more clearly when you contrast it to these two erroneous ideas. When you turn to the Bible, what do you find? you find a very clear insistence that God is not the world. Nothing in the world is God. All things reflect God, that's true, the way everything in a building reflects the mind of the architect. 
But nothing in the world is God because God is the creator of the whole world. And that's why in the Bible, the great spiritual problem is idolatry, which is precisely the tendency to make something into the world into God. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts above your thoughts, and my ways above your ways, saith the Lord. That's a good biblical perspective. What it holds off, of course, is any form of pantheism. Any form of Star Wars theology. God is not the force. God is not the all. God is not nature. But this doesn't mean the Bible opens the door to deism. Because what's equally stressed in the Bible is God's passion for the world. The Pope, by the way, in his encyclical, quite rightly says that even the language of the erotic can be used for God. That God loves the world with this kind of erotic passion. God's not a distant supreme being, hasn't left the world to its own devices, doesn't clear out a space of secularity, but rather God at every moment cares for the world, sustains the world, guides the world, has providential concern for it. God's wisdom stretches from end to end mightily and orders all things sweetly, says the book of wisdom. The God of the Bible is, as Augustine said, closer to us than we are to ourselves and beyond anything we can possibly imagine at the same time. Absolutely transcendent to the world because nothing in the world is God. And absolutely imminent to the world in his love, compassion, concern for it. Ah, this God alone is the God of love. To love is to will the good of the other as other. God is not so identical to the world that he can't will its good as other. He's not so transcendent to the world that he can't will its good. No, no, he does both. And in doing both, he is a God of love. Now, one more step. So far, you're saying, well, okay, I understand why the God of the Bible is not a pantheist God or a deist God. I understand that. But then how is the Christian God different than a Jewish God or the Islamic God? Because those ideas, too, come up out of these biblical texts. Don't the Jews and Muslims say that God is other than the world, yet in love with the world? Yes, they do. Yes. And so far, I'm defending a view of God that that I think Jews and Muslims and Christians have in common. So then, what does make the Christian view distinctive? One more step. It's not the case simply that God loves, but that God is love. And that makes the difference. When you say God is love, you're saying, within the very being of God, there's a play of lover, beloved, and love. And that's the Trinity. The Father is the lover. The Son is the beloved. The Spirit is the love they share. God's love is not just toward the world. That's true of Judaism and Islam. But rather, love is what God is. Love invades the very being of God and determines and defines it. Friends, on this Trinity Sunday, be a little theological. Think deeply and seriously about God, this strange and distinctive Lord who stands at the heart of the Christian tradition the God who is love. And God bless you.